Chapter 16, Lab 1, How to Approach Exam Questions. What I'd like to do in this little uh, lab or video is to go over five questions and their answers. And I'm going to show you how I would go about answering these questions. So we'll start with question one. What port is used by Secure LDAP? Is it A, 389, B, 443, C, 22, or D, 636? Now, the correct answer might jump out at you, but you still want to look at every possible answer. You want to know which one is correct, and you want to know which ones are incorrect and why. So let's look at each one. Answer A says 389. Well, I'm fairly sure that that is the port for standard LDAP, or unsecure LDAP. And port 443, well, I seem to remember that is uh, HTTPS, HTTP secure, whether it uses SSL or TLS. Port 22, well, I believe that's secure shell. So it looks to me that 636 would be the answer. And I remember that 636 sounds like secure LDAP to me. And if we look here, answer is indeed D636. Now, it's a great idea to memorize as many ports as possible. For the Security Plus exam, I highly recommend memorizing the secure ports. For example, 22 is SSH, 443 is HTTPS, 636 is secure LDAP. Uh, there's TACAX, which is 49, and there's uh, RADIUS, which is 1812. In addition to that, you really want to have as many networking ports memorized as possible. And there is a table of 23 of those in Chapter 5. So I highly recommend studying that and perhaps adding it to your cheat sheet. Let's move on to question 2. Which of the following is the verification of a person's identity? Is it A, authorization, B, accountability, C, authentication, or D, password? Well, let's look through them. Authorization. Well, if we think back to chapter 8 and 9, the access control chapters, especially chapter 8, you'll start to remember that authorization comes after authentication. Accountability doesn't really fit. Accountability is something that, uh, you know, is, is dealing with uh, who's responsible for data, who's responsible for things. Not really verification, not really identity, more responsibility. Authentication looks like a good answer to me. And password isn't very, it's kind of vague. It's not very specific. Uh, it's not the verification of a person's identity but uh, a person may know a password, it may be part of their authentication process. So the best answer looks like authentication. And indeed, that is the verification of a person's identity. Authorization to resources comes after a person is authenticated to a network, possibly with a username and password, smart card, biometrics, you name it. Later on, a person has to be held accountable for their actions, for how they deal with their data, especially secure data. So again, we're going through every possible answer and explaining in our minds what those answers are. Doesn't take long to do. In fact, it'll take you less time to do it in your head than it does for me to say it out loud. Question three. A group of compromised computers that have software installed by a worm is known as which of the following? A, a botnet, B, a virus, C, a honeypot, or D, a zombie. Well, this is a group of compromised computers. Right off the bat, the answer that flies out at me is botnet, because we know that a botnet is a network, uh, excuse me, a network of computers that are acting as robots. It's a group of compromised computers. So we're pretty sure that that's the answer, but let's look at the rest. B says virus. Well, virus is uh, 
bad code. It's something that has to be executed uh, in order to do its harm. So it doesn't really fit the question. A honeypot is a computer or server that is used to attract hackers into a uh, false area, a place where there's false data. And it's something that can be used by security administrators to analyze what a hacker might do. And a zombie, that might be the closest answer besides botnet. A zombie is a compromised computer. A person who has a zombie computer doesn't even know. But that's just one system. A group of compromised computers or a group of compromised zombies is a botnet. So the answer indeed is botnet. You want to know all of these different types of malicious uh, pieces of software and uh, groupings and things of that nature. All that's covered in chapter two. And that's a very important chapter in the book. Question four. Which of the following is the strongest password? A says Locrian with a pipe sign instead of the L and a uh, pound sign on the end or a number sign. B says Marquis Decide and there's a one in the place of the I. There's a capital D, capital M in the beginning as well. There's a three instead of an E, a capital S, a zero instead of an O. Uh, so that looks pretty nice. Then there's C. Uh, this is very secure. Capital T. There's a numeric one. Uh, we see a capital V, pound sign, a capital S, number three, and a lot of characters. And D, this is very secure with just one capital letter. Well, if you remember from all the policies that we talked about, uh, especially password policy, uh, usually if you're going to have a complex password, your password needs to meet three of four categories. Uh, first of all, you need lowercase letters. Second of all, uppercase letters. Then you need numerics, and then you need uh, symbols. And you have to have three of those four. Plus, you need to have as many characters as possible. Answer C has the most characters. I think it's 16. It definitely looks like the best one. And it does, it does have capital letters, it has the lowercase letters, of course. It has numeric, and it has uh, symbols. Now, if we look back at answer A, that's only nine characters. Yet, it has symbols, but there's no capital, and don't let that pipe sign confuse you. It's not a capital letter, it's a symbol, and there's no numbers. In answer B, we have uppercase and lowercase, and numbers, and a decent amount of characters, but no symbols. Answer D, uh, also a lot of characters, but only upper and lowercase. So the best answer is going to be C, this is very secure. That's a very complex password. At 16 characters, capital letters, numbers, and symbols. Uh, I don't know of a program that's going to be able to crack that within a couple years. So very good uh, password to use there. Question five, what are some of the drawbacks to using HIDs instead of NIDs on a server? Well, the first thing we want to do, whenever we see an acronym, is we want to state what is that acronym. HIDs, host-based intrusion detection system and NIDS network based intrusion detection system. HIDS is for one computer or server and NIDS although it can be installed on a server or appliance it usually protects an entire network segment or the whole network. Let's look at the answers. A. A HIDS may use a lot of resources which can slow server performance. Sounds like a decent answer. That sounds like a definite drawback to HIDs because it runs right on the server. It uses a lot of resources. That's basically it. B, a HIDs cannot detect operating system attacks. Uh, well, it can. We know that a HIDs can detect operating system attacks like uh, you know viruses and worms and whatever other malicious attacks, Trojans. That's what the HIDs is there for. C, a HIDs have a low level of detection of operating system attacks. Well, it's first of all, it can detect operating system attacks, and second of all, that's its job. That's its, its responsibility. So it does not have a low level. It has a high level of detection, especially if it's updated. And D, a HIDs cannot detect network attacks. 
Well, that looks like a good answer as well. That looks like a drawback to using HIDs because it's loaded on a single machine. It's not meant to check the entire network. So uh, HIDs cannot detect network attacks looks like a good answer. So in this particular question, looks like there's two answers that are correct. Now, if the exam asks for two answers, then that would be what we would say, answers A and D. Host-based intrusion detection systems run within the operating system of a computer. Due to this, they can slow a computer's performance, and most HIDs do not detect network, network attacks well, if at all. However, a HIDs can detect operating system attacks, and will usually have a high level of detection when it comes to those attacks. Now, the question may seem like it's worded a little strangely. NIDs can be installed on a server, and when I say NIDs, I'm saying network-based intrusion detection system. That can be loaded on a server, but in a lot of cases, it'll be loaded on a separate appliance or device or server outside the firewall. So you kind of have to look at the question a little bit. Now, if they were looking for uh, the best answer out of these and not looking for two answers, well, then we'd have a toss-up between A and D. And then you'd have to start thinking, what is the best answer here? Well, A says a HIDs may use a lot of resources, which can slow server performance. It's not definite, whereas D says a HIDs cannot detect network attacks, and it is definite. So if the question was looking for one answer, and of course they will specify this in the exam, select one, normally you'll select one, but if you have to select two, they'll tell you to select two. So D is definite, and that would be the best answer if it was looking for one particular answer, whereas A, a little bit vague. It may, it can, eh, it's not definite. So there's uh, five questions for you and a little bit of how I would go through those questions. Uh, even at this rate, even at this speed, uh, I would still be able to get the exam done. But you got to remember, when you're doing this in your head and you're writing things on paper or on the tablet that they give you at the testing center, uh, you're going to go a lot faster than this. So definitely use this process of elimination. Definitely use this uh, disprove theory. Make sure that you know what answer is correct and why the other answers are incorrect. You want to disprove them without a shadow of a doubt. So that's about it for this lab. And good luck with the practice exams and your final certification tests.